So to get our program started, Whitney, I don't know if you know, but one of our traditions is to try to surprise our daughter with who is going to give their introduction. Do you know who it is today? Well, please welcome to the podium your friend, Jennifer Hancock. Well, good morning and surprise. Uh, so, you know, the Cherokee Park Scenic Loop is exactly 2.3 miles of rolling hills and open fields surrounded by amazing foliage. If it sounds like an idyllic place for you to walk your dog, go for a run or ride your bike, trust me, it is. Many of you are very familiar. Until a few years ago, to be honest, I'd only visited the loop occasionally. And fun fact, I've even officiated a wedding there. But it wasn't until a few years ago that I came to realize that Cherokee Park and all of its beauty offers a special kind of healing. I'm gonna guess that many of us in this room have had therapeutic walks and talks with Whitney Austin around that loop, or strategy, strategy session walks and talks, or storytelling, or commiserating walks and talks. What I've discovered about Whitney as we traverse the hills and I work to keep pace with that long stride of hers is that she is a daughter of greatness. She has inspired me with her utterly unique ability to embrace both sides of every situation. She can be fierce and also vulnerable. She is willful, but a consensus builder. She is a truth teller, but knows when to have a poker face. She is also a gun owner and a gun reform advocate. Some of you may not know this, but I am a licensed therapist and I've had a private practice in mental health counseling for more than two decades. And during that time, I've treated individuals and families who have suffered complex traumas. And I can tell you that many people go on to be part of causes and missions after tragic events. But never have I known someone who decided to start her own nonprofit from a hospital bed after being shot 12 times. After being shot 12 times. Until Whitney. The clear conviction with which she started Whitney Strong and the utter resilience she shows in the face of hurdles that continue to stand before her are the epitome of grace and humility. I am constantly in awe of the leadership qualities that she exudes. What's funny is she thinks I'm mentoring her, but truth be told, she's mentoring me. With every walk and with every stride, I learn to be even more courageous and to be even more artful in my execution. I learned to double down on the long game, which honestly, I hate to play. <laughs> I see you today, those who are here because of her greatness. And I want you to know that I am better for being part of you, her tribe, because I'm learning and growing on this journey with Whitney, for Whitney, and because of Whitney. I'm honored to be her friend and to accompany her on this leg of her journey. So please join me now in welcoming our da daughter of greatness, Whitney Austin. issues because there are moments where I get emotional, but I didn't think standing there being introduced was going to be one of those moments. So thank you so much, Jennifer. I want to first start by saying thank you to everyone on the team here at the Ali Museum and also to Mrs. Ali herself. Um, it is such an honor to receive this award. I'm the kind of person that doesn't like reading fiction, um, mostly spends my time deep in biographies, and when I found out I was going to get this, it was an opportunity to just go deeper into the life of Muhammad Ali, and to think that I have some sliver of him in me um, to receive this award is so special. So, to be in the presence 
of a museum that honors such a change maker. So thank you all very much. Also, I want to say thank you to all of the Daughters of Greatness who are here today to do big things. You have to constantly be inspired, and I have seen all of you and those not here today do big things, and those moments stick with me and encourage me to keep going, so thank you. And then lastly, Lastly, I for sure need to thank the three tables here in front of me because these tables consist of people who go out of their way to help me, my husband, and our organization achieve the big goals that we've set for ourselves. But it's, it's not just these three tables. I can look out in this room and see so many people who have supported us in this work, and no one gets an award on their own. They get that award because of the support that they have around them. So thank all of you. Thank all of you for the support that you provide to me and my husband as we do this work. So maybe you thought today you were coming to hear uh, from a woman who was shot 12 times in a mass shooting tell her story, and I am going to tell my story, um, but I have far more to offer than the experience of what happened on that day. I have a message that is rooted in common ground, and I believe and I know, even more importantly, I know after doing this work for six years that this common ground approach can help you with any big complex problems that you face in your life, whether it is at the corporate level, whether it's in your church, whether it's in the community, but I know that this approach works and I hope that you will lean in and learn some things today because we have a lot of problems in this country, in the state, and in the city, and it is not okay for us to sit in a place of inaction. We have got to find a way to solve these problems and to make our world better. So this is another strategy. To give you an idea as to what I'm going to talk about, I am going to share my story, and it's okay if there's anybody in the room who has experienced trauma that needs to step away, because it is, it is hard what I'm going to talk about. But we're going to get through that. We're going to talk about this common ground approach that Whitney Strong uses to make progress on this issue of gun violence that so many people think is just intractable. It is not. We can make progress. We are making progress. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to give you real life examples, evidence, reason to feel hopeful that change can come on any issue that is difficult. And then lastly, I'm going to close with some of the best tips and tricks I have figured out along the way in doing this work. So that's the plan. I'll start first quickly with a little bit about me. The most important thing you could ever know about me is that I am a mommy to the two most remarkable children who are sitting here on the front row and probably embarrassed that I'm calling them out. <laughs> but they are amazing humans who understand because of the experience their mom went through what trauma is about and they have empathy for trauma and I'm so proud of that. Also, the next most important thing is I am a wife to Waller who was there with me in that hospital room as we made the decision almost instantaneously that we were going to fight this fight and he has been beside me ever since. So I have support at the most important level for my children and for my husband. I would like I'd like to tell you there's a lot more going on in my life, but there's really not. When you live a life of purpose, it's your family, it's your friends, and it's your focus. And so this, oh, this quote couldn't say it better. Nothing in this world is worth having or worth doing unless it means effort, pain, difficulty. I have never in my life envied a human being who led an easy life. I have envied a great many people who led difficult lives and led them well. And as I went deep into that biography, I read about Muhammad Ali. I am most certain that if he were here, he would agree with this. 
There was not an easy life in front of him as he sought to make change. There was not an easy life in front of him as he sought to reach the pinnacle of his profession, whether it was the ways in which he was mistreated by his sponsors to his coming home from the Olympics and realizing that that gold medal he received wasn't going to give him what he wanted so badly, access to rights, access to respect. And those were in the earliest years of his life, and from those moments forward, never easy. And so whatever it is that you care about, you're going to have to understand that it's not going to be easy. But if what you're doing is righteous, it is worth it. So keep showing up and doing the hard work, and you will achieve those goals that you're looking to receive. So September 6, 2018, that's, that's why I'm in this room. That's why I get this opportunity. I, on that day, was just like so many of you in this room. I thought I was going to check into corporate headquarters at my employer, Fifth Third Bank in Cincinnati, Ohio. I mean, it's really mind-blowing to think about how normal that morning was until it wasn't. I drove up 71. I listened to podcasts, American Banker podcast. I talked to my peers just trying to check to do items off the list before I even got into the office. And then I joined a conference call, which you all do it. You join conference calls from your cars. You pay attention to those conference calls. And I certainly was paying attention to this conference call because it was my legal and compliance partners. <laughs> and so as I'm listening to that call and I arrive in Cincinnati and I cross over Fifth Street and I get to Fountain Square, I was so plugged into what I was doing that I didn't even notice no one was on the square, which is a timeout moment. Don't do that. Don't walk around in this world without any situational awareness that could have made all the difference in my situation. And as I walked onto Fountain Square, I noticed in the revolving door that I always used to enter the building that there was some shattered glass. But, you know, I come from a place of privilege. I don't know what bullets look like in doorways. I thought, well, that's a little weird, but maybe somebody just threw a rock, not enough to prevent me from entering the building. So another mistake. I pushed with my right arm into the revolving door, and that was the moment when the first barrage of bullets hit my body and I collapsed on the bottom of that revolving door because the force was just so strong. And to ever a problem solver, I started to think, well, what is this? What, what is happening to me? Nobody's close enough to have stabbed me, but I'm burning all over. These must be bullets. And if these are bullets, this must be a mass shooting because I'm not in a relationship in which somebody would want to shoot me. I'm not in a branch where robberies occur. This has to be a mass shooting. And how dare I think that I'm immune to this? Why did I ever think this wouldn't happen to me? But there's not enough time in that moment to linger on the what ifs, only time to think about how to survive. And so I looked out onto the square. There was nobody there to save me. That's when I realized what I should have noticed earlier. I tried to push myself off the revolving or off the floor to get out of the revolving door, and I was so badly injured that I couldn't do it. Then I thought, well, I'm going to call 911, and I go to move my arm to get to the phone, and at that point I realized how badly injured I was because it was just a dummy arm at that point to try to get to my phone, and that was the gravest mistake because that signaled to the shooter that I was still alive. And the next barrage of bullets came. And I have to tell you that that was the most devastating moment because I may be a problem solver, but I could not solve that problem. And the only thing I knew left to do was to play dead. And I did. And in those moments of playing dead, I said my prayers and I asked, for my family to be taken care of in my absence. But on a dime, the heroic Cincinnati police officers arrived on the scene. And would you believe it was exactly one minute, 
one colon zero zero one minute that I took that gunfire fire and there they were on the scene doing everything that they had been trained to do in an active shooter situation and they rescued me they were able to take down the shooter rescue me pull me out of that revolving door place me on a flagpole bench and do what was necessary calling EMS getting there to help rescue me the rest of it's a blur most of it but I remember getting to the hospital and asking every person I saw am I gonna live am I gonna live I have a five and a seven year old and they need their mother am I gonna live and they always said you're doing great just keep doing what you're doing which of course was not enough for me but I tried to do the best I could with the situation I passed out at some point with my injuries and then when I woke up I was surrounded by the most angelic faces, nurses, doctors, my husband, and they said, Whitney, you're a miracle. You were shot 12 times and none of the bullets hit any major organs or arteries. Ooh. Talk about receiving the most game-changing, life-changing words of your entire life. I went from saying a prayer for God to take care of my family to you're going to live and you're going to get back to your family. And you need to know that not everybody got that news that day. There were three people that died and one other person who was injured like me and survived. And Brian Sarver and I are still very close to this day, but we lost three people on that day. And so this quote, I live in a place of gratitude, this quote does the best uh, description of that. This is a wonderful day. I have never seen this one before. And so this is the exact moment of coming home from Cincinnati. We spent about a week in the hospital in Cincinnati and could FaceTime with my kids, but it's not the same thing. So this is us in our living room where we were reunited for the first time. We've got on our Cincy Strong shirts. We're all eaten up with the love that the city gave to us. And it was in this moment that I understand truly what gratitude was to be able to reunite with my family. But I want you to know that you do not have to have your own life or death experience to live in a place of gratitude. I wake up every day and there's always something that aligns with this quote. I've never seen this day before. I've never seen this beautiful national park before. I've never seen my children behave so well and have, <laughs> have such a great experience together. I've never seen my employees work this well together. Always be in a place to search for gratitude. So now the flip side of that coin in living in gratitude is this. Service is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. That quote is applicable to everyone but it is sure as hell applicable to me, who got everything I wanted in that moment. Of course, my life now is about service to others. And so what that looked like to me and Waller in that hospital room was, how do we make a difference on the issue of gun violence? We're going to start an organization, we're going to bring people together, and we're going to hit the ground running. And we really did hit the ground running, which is a testament to every person around us who supports us. Because, well, I couldn't use my fingers, I couldn't pull my pants up, I couldn't use the restroom alone, but yet we wanted to start this organization and you need your fingers to start an organization. So, so many of our friends from business school stepped up to build the website, to set up the credit card processing, to make sure that we had the logo right. They sent it all over in a package, again, again, because these people support us so very well. 
And we were, believe it or not, ready to launch Whitney Strong exactly three weeks after the shooting in time to do the interviews with Good Morning America, NBC Nightly News, and it was such a testament to the support that we have around us. So I wouldn't be doing my job in front of you today unless I educated you. It is absolutely part of the change-making process to make sure that people understand what's going on with this issue. And so gun death and injury comes with a lot of different statistics, and I'll give you a few. But the most damning one that you need to remember and you need to use in conversations is since 2020, it is the number one cause of death for American children and teens. We surpassed motor vehicle accidents, and as you can see, motor vehicle accidents have been dropping precipitously for decades because it is viewed as a public health issue. And while not initially everybody was on board, certainly there was fear as to what it would do to the motor vehicle industry. Culture ideas changed and people came together and said, how do we make our cars safer? How do we make our streets safer? How do we protect our children and our adults alike in this great country? We're not yet, yet there with gun violence, but I know we can get there. And there is no reason not to try to solve a problem that is the number one cause for our children and teens. They are the most precious and innocent among us. Now, when we're talking about the issue as a whole, how many people are we talking about? 2022 is the most recent year of data that's available to us from the CDC. In that year, more than 48,000 people died to gun violence. And if you want to make that more realistic, that's a person every 11 minutes in this country. Gun violence is the tale of two stories. So on one side, we have homicides that is impacting an entirely different population than on the other side, which is suicide. People using firearms on themselves to end their lives. People are often surprised to hear that 56% of gun deaths nationally are attributed to suicide. So who's being impacted? On the suicide side, it is mostly white males older white males in rural populations. On the homicide side, it is mostly young black males in urban environments. I try to give a little bit of hope wherever I can give hope. One piece of hope is since 2021, we saw the overall gun death rate go down by about 2%. That is largely driven because homicides are coming down. Now, there was a big peak to come down from because COVID was very, very bad for homicides. When you think about all the root factors of gun violence, so many of those things were worsened as a result of COVID. People lost access to so many social services that helped build people up and put them in a place to not choose gun violence. And also because of racial protests, we saw relationships between communities and law enforcement disintegrate. Now, none of those things are fixed. They are absolutely not. But we are seeing things head in the right direction. And therefore, we're seeing the homicide rate come down from where it was in the peak of the pandemic. And some major cities across this country, I wish I could say the same for Louisville, have seen a significant reduction in homicide since the peaks of COVID. Suicide is an entirely different story. It has steadily increased, nearly uninterrupted, since 2006. In 2020, excuse me, 2020 recorded the highest firearm suicide rate since 1968, the year that we started recording this data with CDC. And if the rural population is not enough to pull you into this issue, you need to know that it's getting to our kids. Everybody knows that we have a youth mental health crisis, but do you know that in the last decade we have seen that rate, that firearm suicide rate, increase by nearly 60 percentage points? So what does this tell you? 
we all have skin in this game, whether it's the suicides in the rural areas, it's the homicides happening in our urban centers, or it's our kids. We all have skin in this game, and it needs to be viewed like a public health crisis. So common ground, what do I mean when I say that? I don't think that this cartoon could do a better job illustrating what I mean. You got this guy over here to the left saying, no one should own a gun. And then you've got the guy on the other side saying, everyone should own a gun. And then you've got this precious child cowering. I like to think of him, you know, cowering at a school shooter drill at his school saying, can we please just figure this out? I am a precious child and I deserve for the adults to figure this out. Okay, common ground is not that everyone should have a gun. Common ground is also not that everyone should not have a gun. It is somewhere in between. And when you face these very difficult, intractable issues, common ground is where you start the conversation. Common ground is where progress occurs. So this is where Whitney Strong comes into play. And I love to tell this story. So in the, the, the first couple of days, I mean really I think almost all the days in the hospital, I didn't have access to my cell phone because it had been confiscated for evidence. So Waller's the only one with a phone, but his phone's blowing up. It's text messages, it's emails, it's phone calls, and it's people that know us from all walks of life and from all places. I mean, people coming out of the woodwork from first grade. We are so happy that she survived and we are here to help. And you know what that was? It was a focus group because it was gun owners making those phone calls. It was non-gun owners. It was Republicans. It was Democrats. It was everybody in between. And they were all saying this is unacceptable and we are here to do whatever we can to support you in this work. And so we knew then what we know now and that is we can find a way to bring people together on this issue as long as you build an organization that makes everybody feel safe. And so I'm going to talk about how we use a framework of common ground on our issue. But for us, that really boils down to taking a two-pronged approach. We are absolutely going to be in a place of making policy change because when a policy change crosses the finish line, you're going to impact thousands and thousands of people. But it's the long game, as Jennifer said, and it's going to take a while. But we're also going to be in communities that are most impacted every day because our hands are not tied behind our back. We can every day teach, teach people to safely store, teach people how to stop the bleed, teach people how to recognize the warning signs of suicide so that we know change is happening every day. And it will only be supplemented by the major policy wins that come down the road. So data. Here's the framework that Whitney Strong uses to find common ground. You're gonna to have to come up with your own framework. You can still mine too, but it's not applicable to every issue or every problem. For us, it boils down to two things. We need to have the data to support that is a common ground solution. And secondly, we need to know that it is evidence-based because if it's gonna take a long time and we are gonna work so hard for it to happen, we need to make sure that it's going to work. So what does the data tell us about this issue? First off, I think over to the right is a really important piece to help you understand the sentiment of where people are on this issue. Just so you know, this comes from 2023. So this is right after the Covenant shooting and the old National Bank mass shooting that happened here in our city. And you can see that we've seen a significant increase from both parties viewing this as a very big problem. Over to the left, polling that occurred again around the same time out of Fox News. And when I say we need to have data to support, it comes down to gun owners versus non-gun owners, as well as Republicans versus Democrats. These are numbers for all Americans, but I just want to call out one, the policy that we work here on in Kentucky, and it's called Crisis Aversion and Rights Retention. 
And what it allows for is when someone is in a crisis moment and they want to use the gun on themselves or they want to use the gun to harm others, that we would have a legal path to temporarily transfer that firearm and get them the help that they need. And the polling at that time, which was a little more than a year ago, showed that 89% of Democrats support those policies and 71% of Republicans support those policies. So if we're going to move forward with a policy, I need broad support on both sides and I need to know that it works. That's our framework for finding common ground. I'm going to give you three examples really quickly about how we have been able to make change on this issue. And the first one is in Gallia County, Ohio. You probably don't know about Gallia County, Ohio, but it is in Appalachia. And it is in the county that has the highest suicide rate in all of Ohio. <coughs> and what you need to know is we went into that community because the data took us there and because we knew we could make a difference with our suicide prevention training. And where the common ground exists is not only that we know that suicide is happening disproportionately in rural areas. <coughs> Hold on one second. <coughs> it's also that we found people within the community to lead on this effort. And the best picture that I could ever put in front of anyone is that middle picture. <coughs> so that's the Gallia County 4-H Shooting Sports Club. Those kids are there because they're sharpshooters and they want to go to the Olympics for shooting. I don't need you to raise your hand, I can tell you. There is no other prevention group in this entire country that is invited to a shooting sports club to talk about suicide prevention and the importance of safe storage when it comes to suicide. I am so proud of our work in rural areas. <laughs> now we're going to talk about an urban environment. We're going to talk about West Louisville. West Louisville is not the only place in this city with high levels of gun violence, but most of the neighborhoods with the highest shootings are in West Louisville. And not only are they seeing disproportionate levels of homicide since 2022, black youth now have the highest firearm suicide rate. So they're getting it from both angles. The common ground is not only the data, not only the heart for wanting to be there and make a difference, but also making sure that we have leaders within the community bringing the trainings to them. And one of those leaders is here today, Q. He's not. And when we go into these communities, whether it's urban or rural, we know that our outcomes are statistically significant and we see increases in knowledge with warning signs of suicide, the importance of uh, safely storing at rates that are more than 800%. That's how much knowledge they're gaining in these experiences. And then lastly, I'll try to do this one quickly, but it's hard for me to do because it's the most significant professional moment I've experienced yet. In 2019, we went to D.C. for the first time. We went with a common ground solution. It was background checks. Look, 90% of Democrats support background checks. 80% of Republicans support background checks. And we had our first meeting with Leader McConnell. And we thought, this is going to be easy. We're going to talk to him. We're going to be able to get this done. And it was a very important lesson to understand that this is not going to be easy and that that team was not supportive of comprehensive, comprehensive background checks. So what are we going to do? We're going to keep building that relationship. We're going to keep educating and we're going to find a way to get to a policy that is common ground. Fast forward to 2022. The country was so activated. You had the mass shooting at Top Supermarket that was race related. You had the precious children at Uvalde who had been slaughtered, and Americans across the country were calling, they were emailing, and absolutely that matters, by the way, when, it, when there is a, mo a movement moment, you have to participate. And so what do we do? We were back in D.C. for two weeks. We spent a lot of time with Senator McConnell, and not only was he not a no anymore, he was a yes, and he was a yes, I am going to lead, 
I am going to put Senator Cornyn out of Texas as the lead for the Republicans. Uh, Chris Murphy, who's a Democrat in Connecticut, was put in the lead for the Democrats. They drew their boundaries. They knew they had to stay between the lines because Texas' views on gun ownership are very different than Connecticut's views on gun ownership. But they stayed there, and they were able to get that bill across the finish line. And we played a role in helping to bring 15 Republicans on board to support and 50 Democrats on board to support and passed the first piece of federal legislation on gun safety in 28 years. It had provisions, it had provisions in it to close the boyfriend loophole, to increase the number of background checks completed, to make sure that minors that have records that should be reviewed before they purchase firearms at the age of 18 are included, more dollars for mental health support, more dollars for school safety. So the moral of that story is, it only happened because a common ground approach was taken. And secondly, when you get no, don't take no for an answer keep showing up. We made history together in that moment. All right, I told you I was going to tell you about lessons learned. I uh, certainly have my own thoughts, but I also pay attention to a lot of thought leaders, and two of my most favorite are James Clear and Adam Grant. If you don't know them, check them out. I'm saying some of the things that you say, of course, and some of the things that I say. So if you want to take a common ground approach first, the best way to open people's minds is not to argue with them. Four new experiments show that our views become less polarized and more nuanced when people listen carefully to us. A good listener makes us feel cared about, understood, and curious about our own thoughts. So think about that. You can't do that on social media. You can do that in person. And when you mirror the right behavior to someone who thinks differently than you do, and you show them you truly care about why they think the way that they do, more often than not, they're going to mirror that back to you. And you're going to get closer and closer to a place of common ground and a place of progress. I also say keep your eye on the prize. Of course that means don't grab at all the bright shiny objects, but it also means that you're going to find yourself in a place in which you're working with people where you're misaligned on a lot of other values in life. But this one thing, this one thing that you're trying to accomplish together is worth it. My most favorite quote that I say all the time from the abolitionist Frederick Doug Douglass is that I would unite with anybody to do right and nobody to do wrong. So put your blinders on, find that common ground, and make a difference on the issue that matters to you. <laughs> also want you to put yourself in a position to spend time with people who are different to you. How would you ever understand the other perspectives if you were always in your bubble? I want you to build a coalition around you with whatever goals that you want to accomplish that welcomes diversity, but I also want you to set boundaries. If your approach is common ground and you bring people into the coalition that live on the ends of the spectrum, and I understand that that is an approach for change too, and that's important and complementary to the common ground approach. But those people who live on the ends of the spectrum are not going to be the people that you need in your coalition to make progress. And then lastly, this is so important, the hallmark of an open mind is separating your ideas from your identity. If you define yourself by your opinions, questioning them is a threat to your integrity. And I hate that because in the world of politics, if you change your mind, you're a flip-flopper. That is not the way in which it should be viewed. If you view yourself as a curious person or a lifelong learner, the act of changing your mind is a moment of growth. And so to the extent possible, do not tie your values to your identity. Be a lifelong learner. What can I learn? How can I do better? How can I make progress on this issue? 
So in conclusion, you may already know this, but taking a common ground approach is not going to get you from zero to 100% like this. It's just not. It's absolutely not. But incremental change is better than ambitious failure every single day. And I promise you, I don't know where I am on that stair step yet. I, I think I might be linked to that second plateau. And that was certainly the moment in which I looked down all those stairs and thought, I cannot believe that the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act passed. I cannot believe that we were able to work together in this way. But before you know it, you're going to be at the top and you're going to realize that all of the work that you put in got you to those goals that you're looking to achieve. <clears throat> oh, there was one more really amazing quote in there that disappeared, but um, from Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, that talks about real change, real societal change is incremental. So in conclusion, you've got a flyer on your uh, table in front of you. In case you don't know, today is National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And so here's my orange scarf. The color behind this movement has to do with a young woman by the name of Hydea Pendleton. And in 2013, she was high on life, achiever. She walked in the parade after President Obama's inauguration. And within a week, she was on a playground in Chicago, and she was shot and killed. And her friends and family loved her so much that they built a movement and said, we want to remember her by wearing orange and every other victim or survivor of gun violence by wearing orange on this day every year in orange. And why did they pick orange? Because hunters wear orange when they're in the field, when they're in the woods to protect one another. So that's where that color came from. One of the ways in which we make change is public declarations of the issues we support. So what I want you to do, and some of you are already wearing orange, good for you. I want you to put on orange today, take a selfie, get with a group of people wearing orange, and tag us at WITSTRONG.ORG to show your public declaration that gun violence is a public health crisis, and I am here to port, support Whitney Strong and all the other great organizations in this space trying to make a difference. And then the second thing I want you to do, there are a lot of QR codes. You can find out more about our Save a Life programming, how to volunteer, how to, volunteer, how to donate. But the second most important to me, thing to me on that flyer is to get your support of our bill here in Kentucky. It's called CAR, Crisis Aversion and Rights Retention. I already told you, you got broad support from Democrats, you've got broad support from Republicans, but one of the ways in which we show the electeds in Frankfurt that we have support is with petition signatures. So if you scan that QR code, you can add your name to the petition. We're already over 1,000. I wanna get us to 5,000 before session starts in January. And I have always a lot of requests, I promise. Um, I would like you to ask five of your friends to do it too. And then they need to ask five of their friends to do it too. So keep it rolling. And before we know it, we'll have a very large group of signatures and that will make a big difference in our conversations in Frankfurt with this bill that has bipartisan support. And the last note is, if you have friends outside of urban centers, you get gold stars for those signatures. So try to get us signatures in more rural areas so that the lawmakers can understand it's not just in Louisville who want to see change, it's the state as a whole that wants to see change. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I'm glad to answer questions. Thank you, Whitney. I think I've heard your story so many times, but it still made me sob. 
Um, you're such an incredible woman and such an inspiration. If people want to get involved more, like if they want to do more than just put their name on a petition, maybe even financially help and get involved, what are some of the things that you all need? Like what are some programming and uh, things that those dollars would go to? Thank you for asking. So again, we have this two-pronged approach, the work in the community and then the work in capitals in Kentucky, Ohio, and at the federal level. On the community side, we need dollars to support our program managers. So we have someone here in the city of Louisville that runs that programming, someone in the city of Cincinnati that runs that programming, and somebody in Gallia County. We get requests constantly, can you bring Save a Life into our community? Well first, does the data take us there? I'm not going to go there if the data doesn't. But secondly, the data does, but we need dollars to expand. So bringing dollars in ensures that we can go into more rural areas across Kentucky to make sure that not only they're changing their behaviors to increase safety, but in the long run, guess what that does? That makes them more supportive of our policy work because Whitney Strong's not the boogeyman. Whitney Strong cares about saving my children from suicide. Whitney Strong cares about teaching my family stop the bleed. So dollars go to expand Save a Life work. And then on the policy side, believe it or not, the policy side is me. That's, that's me. And I'm also running this organization and that's not enough. Um, many, many organizations that are doing great work in Frankfurt have a very large policy team. So to be quite frank, we need dollars so that we can bring policy people on board to have more of a presence. Because if you don't believe it's about showing up and giving FaceTime in Frankfurt, it absolutely is. And we need more presence. So thank you for asking. Keyword. Whitney, you know I love you. You like sister to me. Um, since I've joined in 2019, can you just for a cry out for these good folks, and you may not know the number on top of your head, but how many West Louisville residents have we been able to train since 2019? Well, we've trained more than 2,100 in the last four years. That's between two cities. But we have a heavier presence in Louisville than we do in Cincinnati, so I'm going to estimate it's probably like 1,400, 1,500 people. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> and they all get gun locks, by the way. They get Stop the Bleed kits. They get suicide prevention, collateral. Um, it's really, really important work, and we love doing it. Whitney, um... I don't want to put you on the spot, but your children are important. All children are important. And the work that your mom is doing is to help kids like you who grow up in safe communities. And is it okay to ask them a question? <laughs> yeah. Would you all be okay with that? <laughs> yeah. I want to know how the work your mom is doing to help so many is impacting you as a child growing up in a safer community because of her work. Because your voice matters. And you know it's going to matter now and it's going to matter in the future. Have you ever done public speaking? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's your chance. <laughs> well, she's gone a lot. <laughs> And how does it make you feel knowing that other people are shot and injured or killed and their families are without them? Well, it makes it kind of hard to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Scary. Um, it's good feeling a little more safe. It's good feeling a little bit more safe. Yeah. And you know that some people don't have that.
was hoping that uh, maybe you could emphasize once again how important it is to broadcast the message about CAR and what we're doing here in the state of Kentucky. Thank you. Um, I, I may not have underscored it enough, but this work to ensure that suicides are reduced across the state, incidents of violence are decreased across the state, is obviously very important because we have more than 800 people dying in the state each year to this. But what is very unique about what we're doing is that we have bipartisan support. In the same way that you're not going to find another organization out there that's doing work with shooting sports clubs. You're not going to find another organization in this country that has bipartisan support for a bill that restricts access to firearms. And so if you want to be inspired, this is it. If you want to be on the side of change, this is it. We've been working on it for six years. I don't want it to be another six years. And the way we make it one year or two years or three years is all of you. So please sign that petition, share it with everybody you know, and then when it's time for the emails and the phone calls and the showing up in Frankfurt in January, February, and March, think, I gotta go. Whitney said this matters, this really matters. I can't do it alone. Waller and I cannot do it alone. We need you all to help us. Give her another round of applause. I'm going to scoot this this way. Barbara and Lonnie, can you join me up here? I'm just going to kind of get this out of the way a little. Thank you. I've got this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to put Whitney in between the two of you. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Whitney. <coughs> Yeah, just so you guys know, you can become monthly donors, too. Oh, okay. oh there you go. Um, Whitney, and get your cameras out. Here we go. Um, surrounded by Daughters of Greatness, today the Muhammad Ali Center confers upon you the honor of Daughter of Greatness in recognition of your leadership and dedication to social philanthropy, activism, and pursuits of justice. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. We will be back together for Daughters of Greatness in September. I hope you all have a wonderful and safe rest of your day. Please stay around. Feel free to have some more coffee and be in conversation with one another. We appreciate all of you, and thank you so much for being at the Muhammad Ali Center today. Thank you.